you. Thank you very much. Um, you're going to have to bear with me because I have quite a bad cold. Uh, my voice may go and we'll hope for the best. So this afternoon we are really excited to um, share some of the research we've been doing in local schools in Northern Ireland, um, looking at the feasibility of implementing um, computer-assisted instruction programmes aimed at narrowing the literacy gap. Um, it's really fortuitous for us to follow Paul's presentation where we talked about disadvantage in local areas in Northern Ireland because that's exactly what we were interested in. Um, it's not just about improving literacy. For us, it was very much focusing in on a particular uh, group of children, those who come from disadvantaged backgrounds, and narrowing the gap, not just improving literacy for everybody, but actually narrowing the gap for, between the, uh, those children and the more better off children. So literacy levels um, very tied into overall educational attainment. As we all know, educational attainment then has a um, fundamental effect on the knowledge and skills of any population and how individuals within that population um, progress through their individual life, how they then contribute to their society and their community. So literacy is one of the key skills for any child to um, harness and develop uh, from an early age. Um, your literacy level per literacy correlated to your need for social welfare, um, correlated to your ability to get out of that poverty trap and again it ties in very much to what you were saying that children from disadvantaged areas tend to stay in that disadvantaged area not just when they're children but they tend to remain living there they tend to have families there very few people from a disadvantaged background get out of that area that they grew up in um, and so that kind of poverty cycle continues that is linked very much to educational attainment educational attainment is tied very neatly into literacy so we, we've got that cycle so the picture for disadvantaged students um, among the literature um, by key stage two certain groups are less likely to have attained um, comparable levels, levels in literacy attainment. Boys, more so than girls. Pupils who receive free school meals. Um, those who are uh, labelled as coming from a disadvantaged background, and there can be multiple levels of disadvantaged poverty, single parent families, um, different ethnic backgrounds, mm -hmm. and so on. Those are the subgroups that tend to have the lowest literacy attainment and numeracy attainment at that key stage two level where pupils are, are literacy and numeracy is measured. In Northern Ireland, the percentage of pupils receiving free school meals is higher than most of the rest of the UK, and certain areas in Northern Ireland have higher populations of children who are entitled to free school meals. And free school meals isn't the only indicator of disadvantage, but it's one of the key ones that uh, researchers will look at. Um, although the number of children reaching the attainment levels at key stage two in maths and English is improving. It's improving in both those subgroups. So it's improving in children who are from better off backgrounds and it's improving in the children who are entitled to free school meals. So we have a general picture of improving literacy levels, but we still have this gap. So everybody's improving, but we still have those at the lower end of the social um, spectrum remaining below their peers. There are lots of things that work for all children to teach them literacy, to improve their literacy skills. Um, schools will each try and retain and try again new techniques, new types of interventions, and they will all work to some degree. And that's what we call the Matthew effect, that everybody who um, takes part in these interventions or gets access to these interventions will improve. So we still have that gap. So that's really where we are. We have an improving picture of literacy skills, which is great for Northern Ireland, and Northern Ireland is actually outperforming other parts of the UK for the first time. But we still have that fundamental gap between the better off and, and the, the well off. So this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to look at those pupils who are disadvantaged for various reasons and target them. What can we do to help schools to really focus in on those children? Because those are the children that will stay in the same areas, that will have their families in the same areas, that may be involved in this, this conflict that goes on. And it's very difficult to break that cycle. Literacy is one way that we can break that cycle. So empirical research shows that phonics-based approaches are the most effective ways to teach reading. Um, and that has 
that's it. years and years and years of research and things come into fashion and go out of fashion. Years ago it was the whole language method of instruction which looked at, I mean, if you introduce children to books, if you talk about things they're interested in, they will learn to read. We know that that doesn't happen and particularly for the children who don't have books at home, whose parents don't use a wide vocabulary of language, um, who are not talking about books, who are not asked about what they've read, who are not encouraged to read. Whole method language instruction do not really work well for a lot of pupils and particularly not those pupils who have all the kind of backup strategies um, that better off families will have. So phonics based instruction where children learn individual letter sounds, learn to blend those sounds together, learn to understand that sounds uh, blend and re-blend together to form words, that words form together to make sentences, that sentences have meaning and so on and so on. That's the strategy that works best to teach all children to read, and that's been borne out by literature time and time again. Um, the most obvious one being the National Reading Panel um, report in 2000, which most literacy papers will refer back to as being the, the sort of golden standard of what, what works. Um, lots of schools are using commercially available strategies. Some of them are phonics, systematic phonics based, some less so. <clears throat> lots of them work. Some of them don't work, and the research is quite, um, I suppose, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Wide range in effects in terms of what you read in literature, of what works and how well they work, with some having no effect whatsoever and some having reported as having moderate effects. The average cost of buying in these products, and these are paper based products or online products, um, range from £108 per pupil to £205 per pupil. So that's one pupil with a school target and all the pupils that they feel need additional literacy or buying a package that the whole school can um, access, pupils in the whole school. But that's quite a heavy cost on top of what's normally going on treatment as usual in classrooms. So computer and assisted instruction is an area within education that is gaining in interest, popularity, is producing some really strong results. Um, as a way of supplementing what goes on in classrooms. And again, it's not uh, talking about replacing teachers or educators, and I think everybody's made the same point in their presentations today. These are supplementary approach approaches to shore up what goes on in classrooms, uh, to engage children and learners more readily, um, to open them up to experiences that they may not have outside school. So CAA is used to describe specific computer-assisted uh, applications in education that could be simulation, some of the things that you've presented beautifully today, drill and practice of basic skills which cannot go, cannot be sort of undervalued in something like phonics instruction and it's, some, it's become a sort of a dirty word in education, we talk about tr drill and practice as if oh this is terrible, we shouldn't have children practicing these skills over and over, well we should, the literature tells us that in certain key areas such as phonics and maths we should because that is how they learn and that's how they retain these component skills which they then learn to recombine to read and become uh, proficient in, in number practice. Um, again, the National Reading Panel has outlined the effectiveness of computer-assisted instruction, and a number of studies have uh, tried to identify why this seems to work quite well with, with learners. Um, and it's a lot to do with that it increases student motivation because of the format, because of how it appears. It's much more interesting to engage with. It's usually a lot more fast paced than a typical classroom lesson. It allows students to make numerous responses. And this is something that we have noticed um, in our research that typical classroom lessons tend to only allow students to make one or two responses in a sort of a 10 minute, 15 minute period and it tends to be the same students and any lecturer sitting in, in this audience will also recognise that as well it's the same students that will tend to respond and you get a lot of passive learning going on in your lessons. Computerised instruction doesn't allow students to be passive learners. So students are logged in or they're engaging with their own set of materials. A lot of times these um, lessons are individualised, so not every student will be working on the same content. The, the programme will readjust um, based on the responses that they're making. Um, so when we use some of the things that we'll talk about in a minute or two, you will find very quickly that students who start at the same time are dealing with completely different content because the the, the programme has readjusted and updated based on the students' responses. Um, they're able to make numerous and different kinds of responses and the number of times that they respond 
is key to how well they will learn and maintain and hold on to the component that uh, we're trying to teach. So the methodological quality again around CAA is mixed as well with some um, systematic reviews uh, reporting that a lot of the studies reported had small sample sizes like a comparison groups or absent comparison groups. Um, so again, it's showing um, promise but the level of research or the quality of the research is, is somewhat sketchy. Some other interventions have had positive effects while other, others, and it was particularly those with limited teacher involvement that had less positive effects. So there is uh, an important note there that teachers do need to be involved. These are, should not be marketed as a replacement for quality educators, for teachers who really know how to engage pupils and work with pupils. These are very much seen as supplementary to what goes on in the classroom. They can shore up what goes on. So, one of the computer assisted instruction strategies or programs that we have invested quite a lot of time looking at and looking at how effective this is with our disadvantaged population is head sprout early reading and comprehension and the um, content of head sprout has been around for quite a long time it was actually developed in paper form as far back as the 1960s and grew out of a a huge social educational experiment run in the States called Project Follow Through that sadly very few educators in Northern Ireland have ever heard of, um, but the results of Project Follow Through were startling. Head Sprout was developed as a, an online delivery of the content of some of the, the material delivered as part of Project Follow Through. And what it promises through this online platform where students log into their individualised um, licence, where they complete um, at least one lesson four times a day and lessons are anywhere between 20 minutes and 30 minutes that it will do more in less time that it will teach more in less time than typical classroom based literacy instruction will do so it promises or doesn't quite promise but says that more, more often than not it will take a non-fluent reader to a fluent reader in 30 hours of instruction, which is quite mind-blowing when you think about that that's not a lot of time. Um, and it does that through reducing the errors that children make, so it prompts the correct responses if they are making errors. Um, it teaches them skills to what, it's, it's what we view as a mastery criteria, that they are very fluent. They're not just accurate, they're actually very fast at identifying which letter makes this sound. Um, say, the, the, click the person who said the letter sound that was right and so on and so on. It gives lots of guided practice and it works around this idea of cumulative review and application that once you master a particular set of letter sounds they will be represented and represented in, in new formats as you progress through those lessons. So the more I talk about it, the more excited I tend to get about it because the more we use it, the more genius it seems to become because you, know, you keep thinking, well, how's it going to teach them to do this? How's it going to know that they're saying the right sound? Because it can't hear them, but it does. I mean, it's just genius. <laughs> it just is. It has won several recent awards in the States um, because of the effects, because of the outcomes it's producing in children and schools. Um, and it's also grown a, a, a good number of well-reviewed, peer-reviewed, published papers um, looking at the application with different populations, including children with autism, children from disadvantaged backgrounds, young adults, adults with learning disabilities, young offenders, so on and so on. The cost is around $199 for a class of 32 children which is roughly $6 per child. And if you remember some of the other um, programs that are currently in use across schools in the UK are costing up to £200 per child. That's quite powerful in itself. You pair that with the outcome data that, that is being shown time and time again, um, we have something that we're very excited about um, uh, implementing more often in schools. So I'm going to hand quickly over to Catherine who's going to talk about some of our results today. So in evaluating the Head Sprout programme um, over the three year study, we didn't just want to really assess its efficacy with um, the groups of children that Claire was referring to. We wanted to compare it to techniques that are currently used um, in education at the moment for those children. Um, 
This research took place over three cohorts of individuals. So first of all, we had children who had spent a significant amount of their, time, their life in care, but were now fully adopted. Um, the second group of children were those from very low socioeconomic backgrounds that were determined by their classroom teachers to have low reading ability. And the final group of children um, were those who had specific literacy disorder and were receiving interventions for that from their school Senko. So the first study that we ran um, was with children who had spent a significant amount of their life in care. Um, this was quite an interesting population of individuals because they had spent such a long time of their early childhood in care, were now fully adopted, but the educational provisions that were there for them during their time in care were no longer really there after adoption. And their full adoption didn't eradicate the trauma and the disruption that we know negatively impacts learning that they would have already experienced. So um, the table there just really presents some justification for the study. The percentages refer to the percentage of children that reach their expected key stage levels in literacy. So um, you can see clearly that there is a discrepancy between looked after children and the general school population. But more interestingly, that that grows as they progress through the education system and the work becomes more difficult, um, that grows over time. So we, this was a small pilot study. We had eight participants. Um, we implemented a pre and post test control group design. We essentially administered um, a literacy assessment to determine where they were at. And then they were randomly assigned to either a treatment group, a head spray treatment group, or a control group. Um, the measures that we used were the dibles and the wraps. So the dibles is sh are short, one minute fluency measures, which give us a standardized score for sentence reading for each child. And sentence reading would kind of be one of the more complex skills in learning to read. Um, this measure came in two forms, so we had a form for the pre-test and a form for post-test, which really removed any chance of children memorising certain bits of text from the assessment, um, and it also accounted for maturation because this study ran over the entire school year. Um, the second measure that we used was the wraps, and this gave us a word recognition age um, for each child and a standardised score as well. Um, again, it came in two forms, so we had the pre-test assessment and a post-test assessment. I'm jumping quickly through this, so um, we'll just consider the results for oral reading fluency first of all. You can see on the y-axis there we have correct words per minute and from pre-test to post-test the treatment group really made quite a huge improvement in that. Um, more interestingly though to be honest is the decline in scores for the control group. Um, a little bit concerning although it's only a pilot study you would have expected that over the course of the academic year we would have seen some increase in scores for the control group. The same result again um, for um, word recognition age. Um, the treatment group improved by approximately a year on their word recognition age while the control group experienced some decline. Um, when we bring this particular piece of research to conferences, one of the questions that we always get is, well, essentially you've just shown here that some sort of supplementary approach is better than nothing. So that did inform our second study um, where we went on to actually compare two reading approaches. So the two approaches we compared were the head sprite computer approach um, to a method called reading A to Z, which is used quite regularly um, in schools, and it was used in this primary school in particular. It's a whole language approach, and so as Claire's already mentioned, supporters of this approach would really say that with repeated exposure and guidance, so reading alongside someone, that's essentially enough to um, improve on literacy levels. This school that we went to um, was in a post-conflict area of the city. Um, there were a very high number of children receiving free school meals, and we assessed all 60 of their primary twos and um, discovered that 30 of those children um, fell well below the standard where they should have been with reading. So they were all involved in the study, th those 30 children. Um, you'll see that we have a change in measure here. We switched to the para assessment. As I said previously, the last assessment really gave us a sentence reading score um, for each child, 
but the reading ability in this school um, was quite low so that that wasn't really an appropriate um, measure to use anymore. So we switched to the para, which was a bit more age and ability appropriate. Um, each of the children were randomly assigned to either a head sprite intervention group, a reading A to Z intervention group, or a control group. And the graph shows the individual change for each child within those groups, 10 in each group, over the course of the study. And you can see here again favourable results um, for head sprite and perhaps quite worrying results in that some of the children in the reading A to Z group and control groups actually experienced decline, declines in scores. We, I'm definitely not going to go through that, um, we ran some group analysis on the results. Um, the, the key thing that really came out of this was, though, was that um, the Head Sprite treatment group started off with a significantly lower pre-test score on both measures and ended up with a significantly higher um, post-test score on both of the measures. And that was through random allocation, but it was just quite interesting to note come the end of the study. Um, in the third year, we then compared Headsprite early reading instruction with Senko delivered instruction. We approached a school where a very high number of children were receiving Senko support for literacy difficulty, um, and we uncovered here that 33 children actually needed that one-to-one -one sort of session with their Senko. Um, we randomly assigned children again to either a Headsprite treatment group or a control group. All of the children in the control group in this stu study um, received Senko support throughout the intervention as normal, whereas the children in the Headsprout group actually should have been as well, but they were pulled from that to interact with us um, for the Headsprout programme. And again, um, we had very powerful results that really showed that um, the Headsprout group significantly outperformed those in the control group. Um, this had a massive impact for this school in particular because they have now adopted Headsprite as a sort of permanent approach to supplementary literacy support. The strain on time and resources for that particular Senko within that school was just incredible. So um, they're quite relieved to have that and I know that they're still working with Ulster University to actually have our placement students go in on a very regular basis and be really the facilitator for the Headsprite programmes. Um, I'm going to hand you back over to Claire because she's just going to discuss the future of that research. Based on that, we didn't want to stop doing what we were doing, but of course we ran out of money. So we were very fortunate then to um, get some more money, small pot of money, which is funded Jerry McWilliams, who's with us today, for his PhD. Um, we find results which... Um, yes, didn't convince us full, yeah, head sprouts the way to go, that's the only thing you need to do. It certainly appears that when children go through the head sprout programme, they begin to outperform other peers who don't have access to, to head sprout. We, one of the things we noticed was that um, schools were very happy for us to come in to implement head sprout. It all sounded great. We got ethical approval from UU. Um, we made sure everyone was, was happy with what we, we said we were going to do, what we did. We would report the outcomes back to the schools. They were very impressed. In fact, one of the schools actually had an inspection while we were there. They were very impressed by what we were showing them we were doing. When we finish up and we come out of the schools, um, and part of our ethical approval says that we will continue to work in partnership with schools and help them implement this on an ongoing basis if they want to. Very often schools don't come back. So they're very impressed, they love the data. Teachers will report that they see a difference in these children in the classroom. So part of our research looks at social validity data and we'll ask teachers, how do you, you, know, how do you think these children now feel about reading? Do you notice improvement in their behaviour in class, in their reading scores in class, in their enjoyment in reading? and so on and so on. They, re teachers report that yes they do, they see a real kind of positive impact on lots of different variables in these kids who take part in Head Sprout. Very often the schools don't maintain this for whatever reason we, we're not quite sure and I think it's a lot to do with um, schools being under pressure to have something innovative. Um, like all of us that word innovation haunts us, we must find the next innovative thing. Um, innovative doesn't mean new, innovative should mean effective. 
Okay, so innovative could be the thing you've been doing for years, but you're just doing it in a different way to make it even more effective. So the aim of this one was to, again, continue to investigate how effective computer-assisted instruction is um, when applied to literacy skills in this group of children, but also to come at it in a more collaborative way. So one of the things that we didn't do in the early studies was involve parents other than asking for consent for their children to take part and agreeing that when, if they were interested, they could come in, they could talk to us. Uh, what we're doing now with this project, again, across three years and on a bigger scale, is to do this um, a much more collaborative approach. So we want to engage parents, we want to engage the schools more fully. Um, how we ran the previous studies, was we would go in, we would do the pre-test, we would run the head sprout sessions, we would do the post-test, we would report results back at various stages, we would talk to teachers, principals, um, but they had very little role in running the, the intervention. This time we want the schools to be fully involved in implementing head sprout or any other um, computerised assisted instruction that we might want to implement. Um, we want school to school collaboration. So we actually want the schools to communicate with each other. So our plan for this is to um, actually pair schools up and hopefully bring in both sides of the community in those areas that we, we see as the, the areas that could most benefit from supplementary instruction on literacy. So where we are today, today at the minute, we have full-time funding or funding for a full-time PhD student through the Northern Ireland Programme for Government. Um, and we're on phase one at the minute, which is rolling out an online survey in collaboration with our partners in Bangor and Warwick University. And that's really looking at what teachers use in schools to target literacy why they choose those, you know, what, what do they understand about evidence-based instruction, um, why do they make decisions on what they're going to buy in for schools, what are they looking for when they want to buy a programme that will shore up literacy skills in children. Um, we also want to gather information on their, their current knowledge and understand of evidence-based and what evidence really should look like. Very much anecdotally what we hear is, well we use this because the schools and the rest of the town use it, or we went to a conference and this school was talking about this, so now we use it. So there's not a lot of evidence-based approaches in, in um, or not a lot of evidence-based uh, knowledge behind the buy-in of these sort of uh, products that schools sometimes use. Phase two then will be develop uh, uh, an information and training package that we roll out in the schools that sign up to take part to really make sure that we have that buy-in, that we can establish literacy champions in those schools who will take ownership, um, also to include the parents. Phase three will then be to roll out the evaluation of, of Head Sprout and any other computerised assistant package that we may feel would be, would be useful to compare or contrast with it. Um, and phase four then, well, well, watch this space, we'll see. Hopefully we'll be back at some stage reporting on the, on the outcomes of that. Um, so that's really our hope and that's what we're aiming to do over the next three years. Thank you very much.